name is Nick Merriam, and it's super nice to have you here. I am the CEO of C-City. We are a tech industry nonprofit, and we really work with tech companies at the intersection of community, politics, and, uh, and tech. And a lot of our work really focuses in two areas. One, um, social impact and digital equity efforts that we do with the industry, mostly with uh, students. And um, the other area where we focus is bringing you these awesome events where we talk to leaders in our community and people that are able to give you a little bit of a sense of what's going on around the Seattle area. This Roadmap to Recovery series started shortly after the pandemic started. Um, and we have been going strong on Thursdays for a number of weeks. Um, we've had all sorts of interesting conversations, including one that you might want to take a peek at uh, that you can find on our website where we talked to the chief of staff of King County Elections and she de detailed out the entire process that a ballot goes through and all the securities that they have in place to make sure that your vote counts. As a reminder, if you have not voted, vote. Please vote. Vote, vote, vote. Uh, if you're confused on all the King County amendments or charter amendments and initiatives, we have a voter's guide that Luanda will drop into the chat. You can always check that out. It's a nonpartisan guide. It's basic explanation of the initiatives and the amendments uh, that you're going to be looking at on the ballot. So uh, with us today is Kubu, who is the director of Seattle's Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs, also known as OIRA. Uh, Ku came to the U.S. with her family in 1975 as a Vietnam War vet refugee. As director, Ku is tasked, with in, tasked to ensure OIRA follows through with its stated mission of improving the lives of Seattle's immigrant and refugee residents and that Seattle continues to be a leading city for immigrant integration, who has over 12 years experience working on immigrant and refugee issues as an advocate, organizer, and nonprofit founder and executive. And Ku, we're just super excited to have you here. Maybe you can start off and just give us a little bit of an overview of OIRA. Great, thanks, Nick. Thanks, Luanda. Um, thanks everybody for taking a few minutes out of your day. Uh, to join us. Um, uh, so to make this a little bit more interesting, um, OIRA is Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs, not to be confused by the State Office of Refugee and Immigrant Assistance. So we're OIRA, the state is ORIA. Um, it took me uh, about a year uh, to help Mayor Murray, the previous mayor who actually hired me, uh, to remember <laughs> the difference between the two. And he finally got it, um, thankfully. So um, uh, we've been around since 2012 and it just really was a result of 10 years of advocacy by community um, as is the case for many issues. New York City was out of the gate first in the country with such a office um, and it was a compelling model. Um, I don't know how many of you live in West Seattle or in uh, Congressional District 7 where Congresswoman Jayapal um, represents, uh, but she was one of the um, many community members that led for uh, the advocacy and um, the uh, council passed the legislation in 2012 and voila. Um, so this office is only a few years old by, by most standards. And because of that, um, we've been able to get things right in many ways. Um, uh, myself and pretty much everybody except for one person out of our team of um, nine and a half people actually come from community. So um, we're trying very hard not to become bureaucrats. Um, and so I think that's something that uh, we're proud of. And I can give you a few examples of what that means on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so it's been a, a great journey. We've grown um, and some of the things that we work on are uh, have evolved since uh, I joined the office in 2014. So I've been in the job now for a little over six years. Uh, we started with five issues, uh, naturalization, um, ESL uh, in a work-based context for job training, help people find better jobs. Um, uh, community safety, which is probably a really interesting topic or has been um, nationally and locally. Um, there's also language access, uh, which is a newer strategy and Seattle is uh, 
the second city, um, first was San Francisco to actually uh, develop a citywide language access strategy. Um, and so that has evolved. And as you may all well know, some of that has been by necessity to uh, fight the good fight uh, to make sure that we're protecting our residents and immigrant residents and workers against uh, the federal tax over the last three and a half years. Uh, so I think that's kind of a overall um, uh, uh, an overview. I, I, uh, one thing, Nick, if um, if I could share with a few folks some a few data points, I think that really kind of guide us and give a a, a big picture for where we're at today. Um, in our state, we have um, uh, grown significantly um, and then the, the population growth uh, in the first decade from 2000 to 2010 was fueled by immigrants. Um, and so what that meant in Seattle was that we became a city where one in five residents um, was foreign born. And then more recently, uh, that impact because of affordability issues has pushed some of those immigrant communities further south and north uh, into King County. Um, so that uh, I think this was probably maybe just a year, a year and a half ago, where the FYI guy in the Seattle Times um, pointed to data that shows that um, in King County, uh, immigrants represent one in four residents. So. Um, everywhere you go, there's an immigrant, right? Um, so, I, and within that, about 250,000 residents in Washington state are undocumented. Um, and re research shows that about 20,000 are in Seattle proper. Um, I know uh, you had mentioned, Nick, that their folks are interested in DACA. Um, there's a significant population here, uh, both in Seattle and, and uh, Washington state. Um, and then I think I would, just end with another, I think, um, data point that a lot of folks don't know, but really uh, for me describes uh, that when we're talking about immigration, it's not just immigrants, it affects families. Um, and that data point is that 80% of uh, immigrant families are in mixed status households. That means that you have a person who's undocumented, another person who may be a legal permanent resident, another person who may be a US citizen. Um, and locally, what that means is um, that we have um, about 130,000 U.S. citizen children in the state who were denied Federal CARES Act funding because of um, the exclusion of, uh, of that program against uh, people who uh, don't have a Social Security number. Um, and that exclusion was carried through with households, even if um, there were U.S. citizens in the household. So. Um, I'll stop there and see if um, uh, there's anything else that, that might be helpful. Yeah, no, that, that was actually a really great lead into sort of the first question that I wanted to talk about, which is really understanding that immigrants and refugees, like that population is absolutely not a monolith, that there's lots of diversity going on within that population itself. If you could just kind of help us understand what have been the economic and health impacts within that kind of broader population as it relates to COVID and maybe pull out any interesting data points that you have in there. I think your comment about the lack of CARES Act funding going to that large population is, is quite notable and, mm -hmm. and probably very eye-opening for, um, for those that don't work on this issue on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, so so uh, that's an example. Um, I did share the link to the King, uh, Public Health Seattle King County dashboard um, that provides real-time data for um, uh, COVID-19 um, infections and deaths. Um, and I think the latest um, numbers were updated on October 25th. Uh, so Luanda can um, add that to the chat box. And, uh, you know, I think if you've been reading the news, both Latin, uh, locally and nationally, um, I, I admit that um, I'm not a Seattle Times subscriber, although I should be. Uh, I spent a number of years in Washington, D.C., so I'm still a little bit um, biased towards the Washington Post and New York Times. Um, and one of the first stories about the racial disparities and the, um, the disproportionate impact of COVID on communities of color, BIPOC communities as we, we call them now, um, was in the, in the New York Times in April. 
And we didn't have local data at that time um, because in Washington state, uh, we're not required to track uh, uh, data by race, but as the volume of public health information became um, available, um, the public health uh, was able to look further into that and then begin communication to um, figure out the uh, racial data uh, for uh, those uh, individuals. And what we found here locally was just the same story across the country, which is just, you know, um, communities of color have been really devastated by COVID-19. Uh, I'll just touch on a couple. One is uh, that the death rates uh, are four times as high uh, back earlier in the year uh, for Latinos versus whites and infection rates were double, I, I believe. Um, what's interesting to me is that the most recent data, which is again posted October 25th, um, some of those trends have, have been the same, but you're seeing um, an even more significant impact affecting Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities. So I've been asking myself, why, why is that? Um, I don't know that I have any particular answers, um, but it is uh, something that we need to look into. So, um, and obviously unemployment, um, because many of our, our immigrant communities are um, well represented in the central worker categories that um, uh, possibly that may be a driving factor for both uh, infection and uh, death rates. So uh, top to bottom, we're seeing the impact of, of that. Um, and those numbers reflect, I think, just systemic problems we have with lack of access to healthcare, um, affordable housing, uh, education, language barriers, um, and whatnot. And um, I don't think that we're gonna solve those things overnight, but I think there's a heightened awareness that I can share with you that in the city of Seattle, um, we're ready for um, something other than uh, the status quo. And there's been a lot of work to try to envision what Seattle can be. And so some of the language that you might, you might catch on, um, and you know, it's kind of funny to me because the word reimagine really didn't exist in our city vernacular prior to February, but that's been a big buzzword. Another one is crosswalk, which is let's not stay in our silos, but um, talk to each other <laughs> and um, look at systems and how those systems that are the things that we do contribute or hamper um, those systems. Um, and so there's been a concerted effort to really try to look at this from a systems point of view, because what we're seeing um, in those outcomes of both infection and death rates is a product of bias in our systems. Yeah, uh, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, we have a lot of conversations with, um, with city leaders and city staff uh, over here at C-City. Um, and one of the things that I hear really common from um, folks that are in similar positions as yours is that that really drive to a, a greater drive to be more innovative right now and to really think about how to smash some of those silos in service of the community. And, and that is a, a, a common refrain that we hear. Um, and so, uh, and I personally like find that so invigorating. I, I think that that's great to hear um, leaders such as yourself sort of really grab hold of that, um, especially right now. So I, I want to shift a little bit and kind of zoom back out. Um, can you just talk a little bit about the state of immigration right now? Um, I know that that's, that's a very big topic. So I'll mm -hmm. see if you can slice it down to maybe like a two or three minute response. Um, yeah, yeah. But, but like, there's a lot of media, there's a lot of conversations, like, from your perspective, what's happening with immigration in total? Well, the, the, the most significant thing to me is that families are being torn apart. Um, and uh, a couple of resources I would point people to if you're interested in doing more reading on it um, is the um, Immigration um, Legal Resource uh, Center, the ILRC. Um, it actually documents the 100 or so immigration policy changes that have happened under the Trump administration and categorizes them, I think, in ways that people understand. Um, and so there hasn't been a week that has gone by where we haven't he heard about some sort of cruelty or other um, 
uh, changes that the Trump administration, i.e. really Stephen Miller, has tried to um, develop. Um, and if you look at the ILRC, I'll just go over it really quickly. Um, they, they categorize it, uh, uh, I think, in, in six broad categories. One is preventing entry. Um, we saw that one of the first things that the Trump administration did was um, propose a Muslim ban. That's an example. Denying status. Um, so people who have status, who might become, want to become citizens, making it harder for people. So um, increasing uh, the fees, uh, for example, the naturalization fees, which is actually tied up in court right now, the Trump administration had one point proposed naturalization fees to increase by 83% um, from uh, $790 to uh, almost 1300. And uh, something that you probably have heard a little bit more about, um, uh, which is super complicated is the public charge rule. Uh, so those are examples of um, policies that are designed to deny people um, opportunity to change their status, um, become citizens and become voters. A third category is just taking away status. And so we saw that with the attempt to try to uh, eradicate DACA, uh, to eliminate TPS. Um, a fourth is uh, destroying due process. Um, and for me, this is one of the most, um, uh, actually the, the fifth one, detaining, deporting, and terrorizing. And, and these are some of the most heartbreaking stories that we've heard about um, the family separation policy. Um, as a parent, um, um, I've been, you know, just when I thought it was the bottom of the barrel, it just, it gets worse uh, uh, every month. And the most recent one with um, 545 kids who are still not able to find their parents. Um, it's just unfathomable to me. And uh, as a person who's also um, has an uncle who was, uh, grew up in the internment camps, um, uh, it just brought back that sad history of, of um, our country uh, denying civil liberties and due process. Um, and so the other one is just retaliation. And we've heard that, you know, and Mayor, Mayor Durkin has been just calling the Trump administration for what it is, which is bullying and trying to get uh, cities like Seattle where are welcoming um, to try to change our policies um, and uh, attacking uh, our cities and threatening to take away federal funds. So it's a lot. Um, and I think the ILRC resource, the Migration Policy Institute, both are really credible DC-based um, uh, immigration policy think tanks um, do a great job of documenting that. And so it leaves us at this place right now that even if we were to see a more friendly uh, Congress and White House, I think it will take years uh, to undo the harms um, that have taken place over the last three and a half years. Well, I really- But there's good news. I was gonna say, I really <laughs> appreciate that sort of reality check. I mean, that, that did not feel very helpful or uplifting. Um, but uh, but I do think getting your getting your sort of unvarnished perspective on it is is insightful. Um, it, before I kind of I, I want to get into DACA because I think it's interesting. But uh, Sean popped up on my screen and um, and had a quick question. And I, actually, Sean, do you want to just unmute yourself and ask a question? Hey, Sean. Hi. Uh, thanks for being here today. Um, yeah. I guess I was wondering um, if we just assume for a moment that we're going to have a Biden administration. Um, what are the things that that administration can do most quickly to kind of deliver some amount of um, relief to these communities? Um, I mean, obviously, they have a pile of stuff to yeah. deal with. Well, one is it can protect DACA, right? Um, it, it can. Um, restore those attempts that the Trump administration has tried to uh, undertake to take away status. So that's uh, about a million people right there um, who uh, can breathe a little bit easier knowing that, um, you know, that the, the they have a better chance of maintaining their current status instead of um, uh, falling into undocumented status. Um, but really those are band-aids and it's gonna take a Congress and a White House to pass uh, a more meaningful legislative federal fix. Um, and so I think we're, we've got our eyes set on that. Um, and it will be interesting to see um, the outcomes up and down the tickets, right? Where uh, that change at the top will then also reflect um, a greater majority, maybe for Democrats in the House or a change in the majority um, in the Senate. And, 
Uh, so I, I, as you can see from my nails, um, I've been biting them, which is a nervous tick of mine. And so um, uh, uh, election night four years ago was not a happy occasion and I'm hoping for something different this time around. Um, there are other things that I think will help a lot, which is the other one is um, uh, rolling back some of the policies that the Trump administration has uh, introduced to prevent entry. So the refugee um, levels are a great example of that. Um, back in 2015 and 2016, um, at the height of uh, the, the Obama administration, 90,000 refugees were being allowed uh, to enter the US and that number today is 15. Um, so, uh, and that means states like Washington uh, are feeling a significant impact of that. So uh, our state in 2015, 2016 at the height was the top eight um, refugee receiving country. And uh, as Nick noted, that was the way that my family came here. Um, and Washington has a history of being welcoming uh, to refugees. And so our workforce, our communities, um, small business owners, um, and um, all of those, uh, I think uh, communities are being affected by uh, this significant drop in the refugee um, arrivals. Um, and so I think those are some of the things, but uh, we are just beginning to do some of that analysis right now. Um, and because these are federal um, issues, it will take really a, a long time to undo the harms that, that we've seen. And one of the questions that I've been grappling with uh, at locally that we've seen is that, you know, we've invested a lot for, to protect um, uh, Seattle residents and to also, and that, that language protect was not really part of our vocabulary before the Trump administration, but we've had to grow those budget lines like a, a legal defense network that provides free um, legal services to help uh, immigrants have their fair day in court. Um, but we wanna be able to go back to also um, having robust activity around naturalization um, and making sure that really the best uh, defense against deportation is to help people gain status. And so I think we're gonna be looking at how Seattle can um, be a stronger advocate. I think we already are, but there's more that we can do and really put pressure on our um, uh, congressional delegation uh, to do what I think is the thing that can help um, solve a lot of these categories that uh, are documented in the ILRC report, which is helping people um, have permanent residency and then others to have a path to citizenship. So I think those are just a few examples. I, I want to invite you to come back and look at our website as we work through those and uh, continue to be in conversation uh, with us. And if you're interested, we have a um, occasional newsletter so it doesn't get cluttered in your mailbox. We have a pretty high click-through rate of like 33%, I think, um, from our list. Um, so join up, subscribe, and we'll keep you posted on those developments. That is a high click-through rate. Congratulations <laughs> on that. that. You must have great content. So uh, uh, I think it's because we only send out about uh, four a year. <laughs> yeah, that, that helps. That helps. So I know that um, we're going to have to wrap up here really quickly, but I do kind of want to take this really local for a quick second. And, you know, one of the things that we know is that there's a number of famous tech leaders, Satya Nadella, uh, Jeff Bezos, Steve Jobs, they're, they're, son, they're sons of immigrants. And I'm, we're super curious how the immigrant and refugee community is innovating and leading and collaborating um, to really respond to COVID. And we're gonna have to keep the response to like two minutes because we wanna yeah. make sure to try and wrap up on time. Yeah, um, I, I'll tell you uh, the, the best example that we've seen locally is um, immigrants um, developing a direct cash assistance program and um, advocating then for the state to invest and Governor Inslee following through with $40 million for an immigrant state worker relief fund. Um, and here in Seattle, uh, our mayor and our council um, allocated $9 million um, for a direct cash uh, assistance fund. And the, it was, these programs were intended for um, those undocumented individuals and their families who were shut out of the Federal CARES Act uh, stimulus checks. Um, 
And so it was uh, DACA actually youth who said, all right, our government is not doing anything for us. We're gonna organize ourselves. And they did and they crowd, uh, crowdsourced um, and also raised money from private funders to the tune of $6 million um, and built um, a, a whole application and review system also driven by volunteers, 200 um, uh, grassroots volunteers who were uh, able to go through 16,000 applications. And when the state monies and city monies were appropriated, um, we didn't have to look very far. We said, well, you've already figured this out, grassroots community. Um, we wanna invest in what you're already doing and, and um, help uh, our residents and help uh, Washington state residents get the money that they deserve. Is that something? So that organization I just want to call out there is Scholarship yeah. Junkies with Washington Dream Coalition. So if you go to scholarshipjunkies.org, you'll see our um, fund on there, the Seattle COVID-19 Disaster Relief Fund. You'll see the state fund. Um, just a great group of folks. I think um, all BIPOC led. Um, Alejandra, who actually does this on a volunteer basis, um, is DACA. Um, and the other uh, folks there, uh, David, the president and CEO, is a black male. Um, and so I think this is just a great storyline of how um, government can follow and support um, the innovation of grassroots communities. I love it. It's got, it's got everything that I like. It's got tech. It's got, <laughs> you know, BIPOC-led. It's got government. It's got, it's got it all. And it should get some of your cash. So if you're looking for something <laughs> to contribute to these days, throw a couple of bucks in. Um, That's right. So is there anything else that you wanted to note for activities that people can partake in right now to support immigrant communities? I think I think you talked about it at the top of the order, um, Nick, and the, the best thing that we can do for immigrant communities is to vote and use our vote uh, to advance uh, candidates that support um, immigrant communities. Great. So uh, thank you so much for coming today. Really appreciate having you, especially this close to the election. Uh, we know everything's getting busy and crazy around here. So um, really nice to have you. Thank you all to uh, the small group that was able to show up today. We really appreciate having you. Upcoming in these future events, we're going to be talking to uh, uh, the CIO of Seattle Public Schools, or technically he's the executive director of Department of Technology, which is far too long to say, and it's easier to call him the CIO. Um, but we're gonna be talking to him. Uh, we've got a couple other people that are teed up. We also are gonna be doing an election recap event uh, about two weeks after the election, Tech Elect. Come listen to tech leaders, including Jonathan Spizzato, Raquel Russell, uh, Heather Redman, they're going to be talking about what happened in the election and what it means for the broader tech community. Um, so we've got all sorts of fun stuff in store. Uh, and I hope all of you have just a wonderful afternoon. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having me.